this is my opportunity uh, to do kind of a year in review. This is because Jeff Weiss is up next from PHMSA, and I always do this just to kind of you know throw him some softballs. Um, so. What, what we did here is, uh, you know, I sent an email out to a number of people we've worked with around the country and asked them for, what, what were your top 10 pipeline safety things of the year? And uh, this is kind of going to be a review of that. Um, I, I'll be interested during the break to uh, see how well people think I did, because I'm sure I'm going to miss some, or, or that the, the advocates that sent me these uh, uh, missed some. But here, here's our top 10, and I think it actually ended up being top 13. But We'll see how well you count. Uh, and they're kind of in the order that they happen, starting you know, in January through up until now in the year. And the, the one thing we noted was that Congress, at least to our surprise, gave PHMSA a fairly large increase in, in both budget and staffing this year. Uh, it turned out to be a, you know, almost $27 million, which it, uh, a chunk of that is supposed to go to the states, to the pipeline safety grants, which helps support state programs and state inspectors. Uh, another chunk of it, almost $12 million, is going to supposedly hire 109 new employees, uh, and then another two, $2.1 million for uh, community outreach activities. So we saw this as a, uh, this is something we've been asking Congress to do to make sure that the regulators have the resources they need to do their job well, and we were, we were surprised when we read this at the end of December, early January, that uh, Congress actually had given them this money, and, and Jeff who's going to follow this presentation is going to talk about, you know, how they're going to spend all that new money. Um, not too far on the heels of that, in January, the largest spill of the year happened, and it was 1.2 million gallons of ethane spilled into West Virginia uh, from an enterprise pipeline. Um, this is one of those HVLs um, that actually moves through liquid pipelines, and it's kind of carry, scary stuff when it gets out of a pipeline because it'll flow like a liquid for a while until it starts turning into a gas. And um, so, a large failure in West Virginia in January. Also in January, January was a busy month. The NTSB released a safety study on gas transmission integrity management, and we're going to have a session on integrity of that whole thing later. Uh, we found this to be uh, one of the top ten because it really took a kind of a fairly in-depth look at how well integrity management's done over the last decade and what the successes are and what some of the uh, things that, that need to be strengthened are. Um, so we thought that was certainly one of the top ten things that happened. Um, also in January was the second spill into the Yellowstone River within the last four years. You know, 30,000 gallons uh, spilled into the river and less than 10 percent of that was recovered. Um, so that was kind of a surprise because the spill that happened uh, about three and a half, four years ago, we thought it put everybody on notice about river scour and those types of things, but obviously not. Um, and there's still some issues there because looking at the FIMSA website just uh, yesterday or the day before, supposedly there was no property damage from this 30,000 gallons going into the river. So that can't be accurate. So someone hasn't updated their incident report yet. Uh, in April, the largest fine that I ever know of on a pipeline company, 1.6 billion, that's with a B, um, was issued to PG&E for the San Bruno tragedy that happened in 2010. Um, and, and there's a quote from one of the newspapers down there just talking about what happened in San Bruno and, and the, the, uh, the size of this fine. Uh, I think what makes us stand out as one of the top ten is that, uh, you know, it really shows what a state can do when they step, in, step up and want to use their regulatory and fining authority. And the size of this fine doesn't just affect PG&E. I think it sent a fairly strong message across the country that you better know what you've got in the ground and be dealing with it correctly. In May, there was the Santa Barbara oil spill, which we've already had some questions about this morning. It turned out to be the most expensive pipeline failure of the year. We hope of the year. We still got a month to go. Um, with what the current costs are listed at, 111 million dollars, and, uh, uh, and, and brought up some a number of issues that uh, I think still haven't been resolved that we're, people will still be asking about. I mean, we saw this picture you show there. Citizens showed up there um, to look at the beach and found out there. Here it was, you know, fairly uh, a number of hours into the spill, and there was nobody to be found cleaning up the spill. So people went and got buckets from Home Depot and were out there barefoot standing in oil, shoveling oil into buckets. That's not the way 
emergency response is supposed to happen. So that's certainly a question that still needs to be answered. A couple of uh, states have stepped up things. Uh, the Pennsylvania Pipeline Infrastructure Task Force was recreated in May, which was a huge effort. They have a task force and then they have 100 plus uh, people on task groups looking at a whole range of issues in Pennsylvania. And we certainly don't know how that'll ultimately come out. Pennsylvania's tried to do stuff in the past and, and hasn't moved forward very well, but this seems the governor is pushing a real strong effort there, including all the different stakeholder groups. And there's talk of them moving forward to start to regulate gathering lines, which has been one of our issues. Then in August, we got our new FIMS administrator. We were happy to see that after it had been vacant for a while and quick on the toes of that, the liquid pipeline rule that everybody had been wondering what happened to that got released. We hope there's a connection between the new administrator and the rule starting to come out and that would be very good news. One of the other states that stepped up, you know, earlier in the year, uh, Michigan stepped up because of concerns after the uh, Enbridge spill into the Kalamazoo River and they formed their own task force um, looking at what Michigan ought to think about doing to strengthen their safety efforts. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff there that I'm not going to try to read through. The, they released their report um, and then in September the governor created a pipeline safety advisory committee, an ongoing group, to look at specific things about concerns about a pipeline that runs under part of Lake Michigan near the Straits of Mackinac and then a number of uh, kind of more long-term issues about whether the state should be trying to take on more authority, should be starting to look at taking on uh, some of the spill response authority, uh, creating an ongoing advisory group, uh, things that all could be good but uh, the final verdict on those things aren't, haven't been decided yet either. Um, one of the big things that I think can change the industry a lot, uh, other top ten, is uh, um, energy transfer in, in Williams Company's talk of a merger, which would create the largest pipeline company in the, in the U.S. Um, that has lots of opportunities to change lots of things. Um, there's growing awareness around the issue of emissions from natural gas pipelines. We've really seen this take off in the last year or so. A number of groups, EDF who is here and we'll be talking about this a little bit uh, today, um, has been a leader but there's lots of other groups, especially up in the, on the east coast, northeast, really worried about old pipelines and the emissions coming from them and now starting to focus on transmission gas pipelines too and the emissions coming from them. And it really ties into I think a growing concern we've heard all over the place about just the effects of pipelines in a variety of ways on climate change. Uh, so that certainly made our top ten list. Um, and then the one that really just happened recently was the rejection of Keystone. You know, I, uh, we were in a pool betting on what was going to happen with Keystone and I missed this one I think four years ago. Um, so, um, you know, when President Obama rejected it and decided the State Department had found that there was not in the national interest, that certainly was one of the top ten stories. Um, in the paper about the same time, the industry pointed out that while everybody was focused on Keystone, they built the equivalent of ten Keystones moving oil in other places too, so uh, it's one of those focus things. And kind of finally, one of the things, and this is where I'm going to get off on a tangent instead of keeping my uh, blinders on about pipeline safety, is the whole way the public has really stepped up in concern about climate change and a whole variety of issues has started to impact pipelines. And what this is is out in our neck of the woods in the, in the Pacific Northwest, we have a group called the Kayactivists who did all they could to shut down some uh, uh, drilling rigs from getting to the North Slope. And the people are hanging from a bridge there because they, they were hanging so low that the drilling rigs couldn't get under the bridge. Um, and they surrounded things in their kayaks and uh, so I don't want to get off on the issue that those people were fighting with but I think it's indicative that we all are in a new world when it comes to the way energy production, energy transportation is moving and the public's uh, consideration of that. Uh, the interesting thing which I'm bringing up here is that as these kayaktivists showed up, the industry and to some degree some of the media started talking about this as in, oh, there's those silly activists again. Look at them uh, driving in their Subarus uh, and in their plastic kayaks to protest oil, and which they're all using to get there to do their protests. And it became a big issue in the Northwest about these uh, people that don't want people drilling for oil, but, but here they are using it every day which led to our favorite movie clip 
of the whole year where an activist, I think, answered that question fairly well. And let's see if this technology is going to work. Public, we're on the outside going, hey, you need to protect us. And they're like, well, this is sort of the cost of doing business. And then we're supposed to be like, oh, yeah, I drive a car, so guess I have to deal with oil spills. Bullshit. So we do a favorite movie clip. A couple years ago, it was the, uh, the uh, company that shot the smart pig through the side of the house, and then it was a gathering line vice president that talked about how, well, the lines, they just get old and blow up sometimes. And I thought uh, Alexis is a quote there, and Alexis is here today, uh, uh, about summed up that, the whole argument about, well, just because you drive a car, you have to put up with environmental impacts. There also were some significant uh, industry highlights for the year. Uh, that certainly make our top 10, and Administrator Dominguez uh, talked about one of those. Uh, you know, they've rolled out the safety management system, and that's a completely complex thing. We've had people talking about it the last two years here at the conference, um, and it's one of those things that really can move the industry forward. One of the things I, the light bulb effect picture here is the light bulb went off in me that based on the way Congress has written the regulations because of cost benefit, it's impossible to ever get to our shared goal of zero incidence through regulations because regulations can never pass the cost benefit analysis to get us to zero. So the only way we're going to get there is through industry initiatives to uh, move things forward. And the industry's rolled out some big ones this year, the safety management systems. They've developed uh, some recommended practices on leak detection and, and also on uh, pipeline cracking, which has been a huge issue. Uh, so those types of industry-led initiatives really can move the ball farther than the regulations can because of the way the Congress has hamstrung uh, regulations because of the cost-benefit analysis. Um, uh, I think the public needs to pay very close attention to those recommended practices and make sure they're as strong as we think they ought to be, but uh, we're never going to get to zero through regulations alone. <laughs>